Hi, everybody. This is Bob Ose of Theater Resources Unlimited, uh, and welcome to our Friday uh, community gathering, uh, something that we created um, in response to a little thing called COVID uh, and a big thing called a pandemic. Um, back in March uh, 15th, when we were all shut down and told that we had to stay isolated and couldn't get together with each other, um, I was pretty I just didn't know what to do. I, I just thought, okay, let's, I guess it's time to close my company. Um, and as everybody knows, um, and everybody knows me and everybody knows the word, I pivoted. So I pivoted finally and figured out a way of functioning on Zoom. Uh, although I desperately did not want to learn a new skill set. <laughs> but um, Zoom, <clears throat> Zoom it was, Zoom was our really our lifeline. Uh, I decided that it was helpful and healthy to have people come together in a room, uh, meet each other, talk about what they're doing a little bit, and meet interesting people who've been doing interesting things uh, during this pandemic. Um, a lot of us are not only in pandemic shock, we're in post-election shock right now. Nevertheless, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we'll all rally today and give a hearty welcome to John McDaniel, who's going to talk, talk to us today about what I call multitasking. Uh, this man has so many, wears so many hats, he should open up a millinery shop. Um, so I'm going to bring John in and let's say hi to John McDaniel. John, thanks for being with us today. I'm so oh, grateful Bob. to see you. Bob, it's great to see you too. Thanks for having me. And everyone, I see some wonderful friends, new and old uh, in the group. So it's great to be here. So John, um, you, you did, you've done, well, first of all, <laughs> let's get your, let's do, let's do your credits. Cause I, it's not right. every day I've got somebody who's a, an Emmy yeah. winner and a Grammy winner. So um, we all know you and love you from the Rosie McDonald, Rosie O'Donnell show. And um, congratulations on all the success that you've had in your career over the years. Very, very impressive. Um, and the Grammy Award was because you produced an album. The uh, cast recording of Annie Get Your Gun with Bernadette Peters. Yeah. <clears throat> that would be a whole other conversation. I would love to actually ask you how you did that, why you did that, how you did that. Um, it's a huge task to take on. Yeah. But speaking of huge tasks, you wrote a show called Sticks and Stones. Yes, I did. At what point did you make the decision that you wanted to do a benefit version, a concert version of this piece uh, for Zoom? Was it before the pandemic or is it since no, the pandemic? No, it was a result of, it was part of my pivot. Um, I, uh, my collaborator, Scott Logston, and I have been working on this adaptation of David and Goliath from the Bible for about six years. And, you know, you work on something and you then you get busy and you sort of put it aside, you come back to it and you say, oh, this is really good, but let's fix that. So we uh, we got the show sort of in good shape in 2017. We entered a competition, a new works competition in Orlando, Florida, and we won. We were, we were the, like the best musical, it was crazy. And we thought, wow, that's, we still feel as though we have work to do, but wonderful, that was great encouragement. Uh, so we worked on it then through the years, and we, last year, I moved to Florida last summer for quality of life. How's that working out? Anyway, um, so we, uh, we were, we, last year we're tinkering and working on it and gearing up for uh, a presentation that we did in Nashville in February, just right before the pandemic. In fact, days before. Um, so uh, February 25th in Nashville, we did a presentation with a group of, it's a youth musical, it's mostly young people. So we did it with students from uh, Belmont and Lipscomb University in, in Nashville, phenomenal music theater programs there and incredible kids. Uh, so it was perfect for us to get to work a little bit on the show and we presented and then I flew home and then the pandemic happened. And after the presentation, we had actually lined up our first professional production, which was supposed to happen this past July in the, you know, in the summer of 2020. Where so was that? Was, that was going to be at the Encore Theater in Ann Arbor, Michigan. My friend Dan Cooney runs that. And they work in conjunction with the University of Michigan, which is another incredible music theater 
program. So we were, we were really excited about that. And we were choosing a director and we were, you know, the whole thing was moving forward and then boom, pandemic, March 12th, whatever. Uh, so everything began to be canceled. And Scott had the, my collaborator, Scott had the idea to do it virtually. Um, and we thought, how could we get really good people? Ah, let's do it as a benefit. So, uh, and I had done um, earlier in the summer, I music directed the Playbill Pride Spectacular to celebrate Pride. And I had worked with a bunch of great Broadway folks. Uh, I was the music director and one of the producers on that. So I had seen how I could make tracks in my living room and uh, have everything be edited and put together in a beautiful way. And so uh, because I'd had that experience, I thought, let's do Sticks and Stones that way. That's a long answer, but that's how it happened. Well, it's going to be a longer answer because I got a lot more questions. Good. Um, okay, so so let's let's start the process. Uh, let's take it step by step. Okay. Um, you made the decision. First of all, you made the decision to do it as as a benefit. Um, right. Basically, uh, am I? Is it fair to say that you wanted to sidestep the complications of a, a SAG versus equity in terms of contracts that are available? No, because you still have to deal with them. Um, so it really wasn't a consideration. What it was, was we couldn't afford to get the kind of people we wanted in a commercial sort of a way. So we thought, let's do it as a benefit where people are anxious and interested in, you know, being a part of it. So very quickly, we, uh, we went to Lady Gaga's organization, Born This Way, which she founded with her mother, Cynthia. And we knew that October was anti-bullying month and our show deals with anti-bullying. And so we felt like this was a really good target for us. So that was, that was our goal. And Born This Way very quickly said, we love this. We want to partner with you. We want to do it with you. And so based on having Born This Way, we were able to get Audrey McDonald and Javier Munoz and George Salazar and Michael Kilgore and the incredible Josh Colley who played David. So, yeah, so that's sort of, that was the, the way that sort of went through the meat grinder. So I'm going to start taking us step by step because Great. we have, a, you have a room full of people that are looking to produce things on Zoom. Great. And uh, how you made your decisions and why you made your decisions, I think is valid for all of us. As it turned out, you wore many hats. I did. When you first set out to do this, what were the jobs you knew you couldn't do? Well, I couldn't perform it, um, but I, and I couldn't do the uh, audio and video editing. Although since then I've started to work in iMovie and I'm so excited about that. All the things we're learning in this, is just crazy. Um, but anyway, I digress. But I do think that, that there are some, so many uh, incredible uh, silver linings and byproducts uh, to this, to being, to this shutdown, to being in this weird situation that who could have ever thought we'd be in, but here we are. So, um, so I knew that I had to get, um, a video and audio editor and that was sort of the big task. So I set out to figure out who we want, you know, Scott and I talked about who do we want to work with. And I have had a friend in Los Angeles for years and years, decades, actually, who is um, a writer, a composer in his own right, but he's got a studio. And, and because we're such good friends, we've been looking for a thing to do together. So, um, and I always recommend working with people you know, because that's just, <clears throat> it's great. It's the, way that, it's the way of the world, I guess. But um, because we already had a shorthand and because we actually have a history and we actually love each other, we, we came at it from a very um, safe place. And um, it was, it was, really gratifying creatively, even though he wound up working way harder than he ever thought he was going to. And I'll tell you more about that. When we well, because we're going to talk about the phenomenal editing on that on your piece. It was extraordinary. Oh, um, but before we get to that. So yes, I was I was assuming that one of the answers to my question was going to be you needed you needed tech help, you needed people that that can do the tech. Um, right. You co directed it co produced it. Uh -huh. Tell me what the what was your what were your partnerships like? Who did what? Um, how did you how did you visualize it uh, so that you had the product that your editor could take into post production and create the wonderful effects that they created? Yeah, so um, I mentioned the Playbill Pride Spectacular. The video editor of that was uh, this phenomenal guy Roberto, uh, who works for Playbill uh, online, Playbill.com, and. Uh, 
we had a great collaboration on that. And um, when it came time to do Sticks and Stones, I asked him, well, talk to Scott. And we decided that we loved what he had done so much on the Pride Spectacular, let's invite him to do Sticks and Stones. So, uh, so we did, I lost my train of thought. What was, I'm sorry, what was your question? I was, I was asking how the collaborations work because you, you right. co-directed, I think you, am I right? You co-directed and you yeah, co-produced. So Scott, Scott and I directed, we just, oh, yeah, it's, sorry, it's my Frenchie. Um, uh, Scott and I decided we would direct it and produce it together. Um, and so we did split up the duties. I was much more heavily involved in the music editing and Scott was much more involved in the casting and corralling of these 135 kids from around the world that we wound up having in the ensemble, which again, we'll get to, but that, that was- uh, really let's, let's, let's take it step by step. Tell step. us about the audition process for the 135 kids from around the world. Okay, so once we had um, the Born This Way Foundation, we knew that we wanted a large ensemble and we wanted a very inclusive ensemble. We wanted the rainbow to be uh, represented. Um, so we, we put a casting notice out that we were looking for young performers. These are people whose high school shows have been canceled or summer camps were canceled and who, you know, didn't have any outlets to perform. So we uh, advertised on Broadway World and Playbill and every, you know, theater mania everywhere that we were holding auditions. We created um, email addresses for the different characters and we had, we had open submissions. So we had almost 1300 submissions from young people between, I think we said 16 to 23. It was basically that. And that was a lot for Scott and I to sort of go through. You can tell pretty quickly, as you know, if you've, you know, you've done auditions, you know pretty quickly, but still you have to sort of find the, the cream of the crop as you uh, look through them. This so is Scott, of interest to many of us. How were the auditions held? Uh, were, were, were they, did you do a Zoom audition or did they send no, you, they just, send you they videos? Just submitted. They submitted videos and uh, they answered a questionnaire. It's kind of like how I do it at the O'Neill. I'm the artistic director of the Cabaret and Performance Conference at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center. And every year we look for a crop of fellows who want to come and study performance. And that's, that's it's so great because they just, they um, folks send in videos and, um, and I have a sort of a questionnaire that I ask about their interest, their experience and where they are and what they like to get out of the conference and stuff. So we created our own um, uh, template for that questionnaire. And really it was, the, the, the kids were amazing. There, it, was, it was really difficult. We had thought we were gonna select something like 75 or 80. We wound up bringing that up to 135, which also included a lot of alumni from our demos and our previous productions. Some kids who were in the show in the Orlando 2017 production and some kids who were in the, uh, the Nashville uh, Oh, sorry, I've got to get, got to get the, um, the Nashville workshop that we did. So, yeah, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people too. It's uh, a lot of people. So, which, which, which is going to lead into some of the other questions I have about this. Um, who designed the backgrounds? Who chose the backgrounds? Was everybody against a virtual background? Um, how did you get your actors set up so that they came off? as good as possible. Did you send them ethernet cables and green screens and all that? What did you do? Oh, no, um, it was kind of a combo platter. So that's a lot of questions. Let me just see if I can yeah. remember them all, Bob. So uh, Scott and I did a series of meetings with Roberto, our video editor, going through the script. Scott had, had created a teleplay uh, that was very specific about when we see people, when characters disappear, when and actually, when we went into it, it was more complicated than it wound up being because we had very little time and it wound up being we had to make some decisions about cutting some things we would have loved to have done more. But and we did a lot, but we had to find a happy medium. Um, and Roberto was really he was amazing. He listened. He um, uh, took notes, the copious notes. And based on our our, our vision, he translated and he took it farther than we ever could have imagined, which was, which is really what you want when you're collaborating with somebody to not just do what you ask, but to make it even more, you know, spectacular. And he did. So you had to have a, 
a very good idea of what your background setups are going to be for your for each of your actors ahead of time. I, I got to say, I was especially I was impressed by a lot of it. I was especially impressed by the 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 uh, two sisters in the frame that looked like they were actually in the same room. There was no separation between the two frames, mm -hmm. and it yeah, might as yeah. well have been a duet on stage. Yeah, we had asked them to record against a, as neutral a background as we could, and Roberto can. Um, has the ability to sort of match and to take one and make it a little darker so it matches the other and it's kind of a wizard like that so that was that was how we did that and okay. how does i guess i guess he's the one who knows how you take out the, the sense of it being two separate frames because we always when, when, when we when we do it we always look like we have two frames yeah there's always, a, there's always a frame around the frame yeah he was able to dissolve that and make that make that a beautiful thing so that was done in a graphic dissolve in, in post-production. Um, so how many things did you do? <laughs> you you co-directed, can, can you define for us a little bit more specifically what co-directing meant in, in this situation? Sure, I think Scott and I just realized, because we both directed things. And so we felt like we, we didn't really want to delegate one to be the director. And, you know, I, it, it didn't seem like it made a lot of sense to have me be just the music director and Scott be the director because we've both written this sung through piece and we've both collaborated on words and music. Um, uh, so, although I've written the lion's share of the music and he wrote the lion's share of the lyrics and really we didn't, thinking back, I made it sound like we both wrote both, we haven't. Um, so we, we decided to direct it and produce it ourselves. Um, directing means, in this so, case. So we had, we set up Zoom rehearsals with the various people in the various songs. So for example, the, we had seven uh, brothers of David and the brothers were in uh, a lot of different songs together and bits of songs together. So we had a brother's rehearsal on Zoom, um, for example, and, and Sorry. Yeah. Um, and so we, we set aside time uh, and, you know, created the Zoom link and had everybody come in. And Zoom rehearsals, as you know, are very frustrating because you can't sing and play at the same time. So it was essentially me singing and playing each of the parts. I was recording it and they were recording it. Uh, they had music that they were looking at. And we, uh, you know, we did the best we could in terms of getting the information to them about the way to, you know, record it, the way to, to deliver it, um, the, the acting beats, the, the waiting, the, the discovery, the, you know, we had to just feed everything sort of in one direction. And we weren't able to sit in a room like we would do on Broadway and, and, sing, and rehearse it and say, yes, that's it. Can you cut off sooner there? You know, it's just, it was really, it's bizarre, but you can do it. Um. I'm trying to pull out some more information. Um, yeah. You. I can tell you how more. How did you deal with late? Well, you know what? A very basic question. You recorded everything on Zoom or did you no, use a no, different platform? They, they created their own video tracks and then submitted them to a designated Dropbox that we set up. Okay, so they created their own tracks. Right, here's, so here's what happens after the rehearsal and then I say, okay, I'm, I'm really happy with the key we're in. I know the tempo. Then I create a piano track and then I upload that piano track and they have a link to where the, the resources are and the, the piano track is there. Then they download that track at home. They play back the track on one device like their phone and they wear headphones so that, we, so that they hear the piano but when they're singing, we, we don't hear piano. So then they create like a quick time video on their laptop or iPad or whatever their second device is. And that video has their beautiful face on the neutral background with lots of light and, and their voice. So, um, so, uh, so that, and then they upload that video and that goes into our, the, each song has a different folder. And so they put, they're in song number four, they put it in the number four folder. And then it goes to audio editing so that Ron in LA would pull all of the videos for song number four and each song has a slate 
I create a slate with the piano track. So I say three, two, one, clap. They clap and they, they say clap and they clap physically so that the editors know where to line it up. So then Ron uploads, uh, downloads all the videos and lines them all up and then sees what he's got. And what he found was a ridiculous mess because we had never had that rehearsal in the seven chairs to say, don't forget, this is where we cut off. This is where the T goes. Even though they had that information, it's, they're doing it by themselves in their bedrooms. I mean, this is like insane. So Ron had to then fix a million things in every song. Um, somebody came in too early. Somebody's Somebody had, you know, a car went by in the background or which he had to duck out or, you know, a million uh, issues. And he had to balance them and make, make a really nice audio situation. It's a funny thing. You can, you can forgive weird images with your eyes, but your ears, uh, you want to make the, the sound excellent, as, as good as you can do. And then if the, if the video doesn't quite match, you, you notice, but you, it's not as bad as if the audio isn't matching. Does that make sense? Um, well, you know, we, won't, we, won't, we had many conversations here about the problems with late, basically it, it, stems, it stems from latency. People can't, can't simultaneously or rehearse together. Not. Right. Without, you, you have to, we know you have to make the track. Um, do you happen to know this software or the application or the platform that your editor used? I'm sure everybody would love to know that. I don't, I don't, but I can get it to you and you can. You can I can share it with everybody. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've asked him and he's told me, but I can't remember. Uh, OBS perhaps? No. Mm, it doesn't sound familiar. Okay. Um, so, so you, the, the, the key that I think I heard earlier is that your partner scripted the entire thing. So, you had an idea that where, where you wanted to have floating frames and you had an idea of what, where they wanted to be in a location and where you wanted to move things where where things stayed the same all of those locations were figured out by us yeah okay so that that in itself is, is a talent um and hopefully uh people that are um in the room who, who want to do this will understand that they need to actually sit down and script everything everything that they want it's not going to just happen by accident right i mean the easy easy answer i was i was hoping for was that you recorded everything and then your brilliant editor found found ways of moving them around in space and having them in with glows around them and but he was actually all, told what to do all the while telling the story yeah he yeah. was but he but then for example there's a, a song where uh, the prophet samuel is choosing one of the brothers and so we didn't really know how that was going to work, but he had them come across the bottom. And when Samuel said, no, it's not you, Roberto made them sort of disappear in a puff of smoke. And it was the most beautiful way to tell that. Scott and I hadn't said they disappear in a, in a poof of smoke because we didn't really know what or how he could do it. But he made that happen and it just made us roar with laughter. It was great. Um, Sam uh, Berlin, do you have your hand up? Did you want to ask something? Yes, um, I used to help somebody out with audio problems where they took the music and put it through a mixer and split it, pan right for the music, pan left for the dial, for the singing. And then you uh, use a, audio, a mixer that has USB into the computer. So when you record it with your music, they can have the, their singing on the left channel and your music on the right. And then you can take off the music and put your music back in. So then they would have no problem with having any problem with their audio. So you have independent singing without the music and then you have the music on the other side, on the other channel. Yeah, my, Ron, our audio editor was very, um, he, works in, he worked in stereo so that, because so many people who watch things nowadays in their, their homes have like a home theater. So stereo is really a, a, a very, uh, and not a lot of, Platforms will necessarily broadcast in stereo, but we we um, that was important to us to make us in, in the stereo. audio. Um, but you, if you pan left, you can always pan back to stereo on the singing again and remix it into your stereo 
of your music track. So it, it doesn't matter. It just gives you the ability to have just the singing minus the music and re -lip, lip lip syncing it back in to your original music track and match the audio up with the music and then the then the singing will be in the, where you want it to be. Super. The whole look, the whole reality of the fact that so much is recorded in, mon in uh, mono uh, hit me when I was listening to somebody's show with my headphones on, and it was like everything was in one ear, which drove me crazy. So uh, the stereo is actually very important in many ways. Elizabeth App Appel, did you want to ask something? So John, when you are scripting where the frames should be, do you write that? How do you do it? Do you draw a little chart or how did you do that? We, we put those directions in red. Um, so it would say we move to the, to the marketplace or um, the, these vendors are singing to David's mother just to, so that it was clear for him to understand um, the, the context of each scene kind of. Does that make sense? Well, I'm, I'm just, I haven't seen it, so I don't know, but um, were, were, were there moments when there were two frames at the top of the big frame and two frames at the bottom of the, and did you? Yeah, sometimes we would write that sort of thing out, but we, I didn't want to hamstring Roberto too much ah. with that. I wanted, because I knew with my experience with him that he could, he could do it and figure that out. Right. And sometimes he would have, he would, favor one over the other. And I didn't want to direct him to, um, I didn't want to box him in. And also I'm glad I didn't because I allowed him the freedom to make it even more than I could have imagined. We had uh, the brothers sing in the show as a boy band, like in sync. So there was, uh, he made this, uh, this virtual arena and then their, their boxes, their, their faces, their images were moving throughout the arena and almost dancing. It was this crazy, beautiful, beautiful yeah, thing that, that the, I, didn't, I didn't direct him to do that. Although I said in sync boy band, you know, like Madison Square Garden right. took it to the next level. And yeah, it's best uh, to leave to the expert. <laughs> am, I, am I right, John? Do I remember that, that, that the frames were not always horizontal frames that they were sometimes uh, man, man, manipulated into different shapes? Definitely. And sometimes they were blurry. And as the show went on, we got away from boxes and moved more to voices in David's head, which were, you know, sort of cloudy um, with fuzzy, you know, rounder edges. And um, it was nice that way. And I just also want to remind everybody that the Theater Authority Benefit Agreement meant that after four days, um, it had to disappear from the universe. Um, and the Musicians Union as well, same thing, four yeah. days. You, you didn't get to keep a copy for yourself, did you, for reference? Oh, no. Oh, no, of course not. Of course not. We'll talk later. Okay. <laughs> um, other questions from the room? Yes, uh, Sam is saying that some of them were like like thought balloons. That, that I guess that yeah. would be. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so. You can, I can tell you that you can see we, we did a, we were able to put one song, our opening number, Survive. It's on, uh, it's on YouTube if you search Sticks and Stones, Survive. Um, you, can, you can actually see the opening number and see what Roberto did. It's set, the opening is set in a, in a schoolyard and he contextualized the whole school thing so, so well. And if I remember correctly, the one full screen was Audra. Was yeah. Um, we left, we, we kept her number very simple because she is a master and she did all the work and we didn't, we decided not to do anything at all, just to let her um, fill the whole screen and do her thing on her one big solo. Now, I, I'm already forgetting now, was it, it wasn't just a piano, it was more than just a piano track, wasn't it? Did, oh yeah, so after the, the, the piano track is uh, done to click track, it's our guide, but then Ron, um, and I added instruments to that and we built a band. So Ron did some drum programming. I did some more keyboard stuff. He played bass and some guitar things. We also had a second guitar player that we um, farmed out some of the more intricate guitar stuff too. Uh, so we created a, a soundtrack. You'll hear it on the, on the YouTube clip. Okay, so, um, Carol Weiss. Carol! 
We've been friends for such a long time. Hello, you know, my dear. How fun to see you. Oh, I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> so I have two ridiculous questions. Your phone's ringing. And that's not my phone. How <laughs> how long did it take? How long did it take to do all of this? And if you don't mind, a ballpark of what it cost. Okay, so we. When did golly? Let me think this through. So we delivered. Let me just look at my calendar really quickly. Um, we, we we set ourselves some ambitious goals. Um, so we were we were organizing in August, early August. Uh, Audra said yes, and honestly, once Audra McDonald says she's in, you can get to see anybody. Um, <laughs> And so, and we knew that we went to her first because we knew that. Um, so then we um, we started rehearsals on uh, yeah, first week of September, and then I was creating piano tracks the second week of September, and then they went out to artists and they made their recordings through the third and fourth week of September, and then. All materials were meant to be to audio by September 28th, but there were a few late things, but most everything was in. So then audio was editing sort of the first two weeks, uh, last, the last bit of September, early October, then things were beginning to go to video. Sometimes they were rough audios going to video. Um, and then Roberto was able to start working video. Um, we delivered the the show premiered on, on uh, October 16th, and we had to deliver the show by noon the day before to, to Broadway Cares, which was another uh, charity uh, organization we brought in. Sure. Which I'm yeah. happy to talk about. So, so months, okay. Yeah. Okay. And on the cost, the cost, we, um, we, had because it was a benefit we were able to get folks to donate a lot of of services but we did have to pay um we had about seven thousand dollars in expenses not uh, bad not bad <laughs> I, know. I know for an hour show that really Gosh. beautiful yeah thank you dear and what kind of dog is that he's a french <laughs> uh, oh look oh my god okay. beautiful we rescued him last summer he rescued us. You know how that works. Oh, please. I have to. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll interview him next week. Okay, um, good. Okay. He's available. Oh, good. <laughs> um, now I forgot what I was going to ask you. Um, the, the time frame, yes. Um, how many? Okay. I counted four things that you were doing. Music director, co-director, co-producer, and what was the other one? I, what? I wrote the music and, and the writer. So how how did that eat into your time? I mean, was this your whole life? Uh, kind of was. It kind of was because even once I was done creating all the piano and keyboard stuff, I was constantly listening to versions of the band tracks that Ron was putting together and and creating and fleshing out and get sending back notes. Um, that Ron works through the night so that when I would wake up in the morning, Florida time, he my inbox was full of stuff to listen to and then he sleeps in the daytime. And then <laughs> it was one of those sort of crazy, crazy okay. things, you know, artists, aren't we wild? So, um, so, but, but it was- But he has a beautiful coffin that he sleeps in. He does, he does. Yeah. Uh, it, so it, it, it does become, it's absolutely your life. It's your life. And then once I started getting a video um, things to look at, um, then there's notes on that. But we, we got ourselves and, and Scott and I decided that only I was going to see the video stuff and give notes on that because Roberto and Ron actually music as well. So I wound up being the point person for notes. So I would share with Scott when things would get to a place where I was proud of it. 
And he would have ideas or thoughts, but sometimes we were too far down the road to fix. Sometimes we were able to, it just really, it was a time thing, you know, but, um, but Roberto would not have been able to be in a position to take notes from more than one person. That's just kind of important. Next step. How did you decide what platform you were going to stream on and what did you choose? So we didn't know when we went into it, what we were going to wind up with. Um, what wound up happening was uh, the Born This Way Foundation wound up uh, not supporting us in the ways that we had been led to believe in terms of publicity and marketing. And so there was a time where we were really far down the process where we realized we had to, to um, figure out a way to, we, we, need, we needed a, a, a we needed someone to throw us a life jacket or what's it called? What's the ring called? Uh, a life uh, preserver. Life preserver, yes. So I called my friend Tom Viola who runs Broadway Cares and I explained the situation. I said, we're in this, we're kind of down the road on this beautiful project, but we need help. And he said, we would be delighted to come on board with you. And so we, and we had already kind of gone out to Broadway World. Uh, Broadway World was gonna support us and, and be the one of the streaming platforms, but because Broadway Cares has their own they, they're just, they know how to create content. They know how to market mm -hmm. content and how to get it out there. So it wound up being uh, streamed on Broadway World as well as on broadwaycares.org, which had a link through to YouTube. So it was- Is Broadway World, of, is the Broadway World platform Broadway On Demand or is that two different things? They, well, they have two different, well, they, they can do it ticketed. We decided to do it free for donations. So then, um, because that's the way Broadway Cares has found the, the best success in raising money. Sometimes a ticketed thing, some, you know, we all know there's so many things that we are asked to watch or, you know, um, there's only so much you can do, but if it's free, you may watch it. And then maybe you're, you're motivated. Hey, I'll send a hundred bucks. There goes my phone again. Hold on. Mr. Popular. Now you're muted. Okay. You're okay. Now I'm unmuted. I didn't think you needed to listen to the phone ringing. Um, so uh, I'm going to get to Joan, Joan Ross Sorkin's question in a second, but I, I wanted to complete this. So what was the mechanism you used for taking donations? Probably um, Harris has, uh, well, there were, there were various ways that people could donate. There was a donate button, I believe on the Broadway cares streaming, uh, platform. Um, and people can, I just really can't remember. There were there were donate buttons all over the place and link, were? links to donate. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I guess there were. I think there were links. There weren't buttons. There were. There were. It was. It said go to this. Go to this uh, URL. Which in the middle of watching something. Yeah, I think on the Broadway Cares YouTube because they have like a crazy amount of subscribers to their YouTube channel. There was a donate button that you could actually press. Okay, when I was watching it, there wasn't a donate button. I was curious about that. That's because so, there were different places it was streaming, so yeah. it's was, it was always different. I think I just, I, I'm not sure where I was watching it. Was it YouTube? I don't know. It was whatever link I was given. So um, I'm not sure about all that right now. Um, the, I know that Broadway on Demand is one way that some of us can go in terms of putting content out for, for viewing. And I know uh, this on the stage.com, which is like, to me, it's the easy button. That's the easiest one to use, which I don't think you used, but on the stage.com really provides you with a, a website, a, a multi page website and donation buttons and all sorts of things that, and marketing, they give you some marketing as well. So um, that's what a lot of us are looking for. Jonathan Williams asks, any suggestions for producing a zoom show if you don't have a Roberto? And my suggestion is don't. <laughs> Get a Roberto. There are people, I mean, you need a tech person. You need somebody that can actually make this, whatever you're doing, look, look good. I'm, I'm being snarky. You can yeah. actually produce it. You can produce this. We, we were making a movie, really. We weren't doing a Zoom presentation because it wasn't on Zoom. We rehearsed on Zoom, but that was the end of the Zoom. Everything after that was creating content to be streamed. So th this goes back to basic conversations that we've had many, many, many weeks, which is the difference between something that's, li uh, that's live streamed on, like, and, and is, is performed live and things that are 
recorded and then streamed after after uh, post production, and um, it's there are two different two different choices. Um, I think you get a more sophisticated, slicker product if you go into post production. Um, however, for my benefit in, in January, for the true benefit, I really want to do a combination of live and uh, and record recorded pieces. Yep. yep. I just think there's something you can't rec you can't replicate the feeling of somebody actually talking to you live. Um, yeah. No, I think your instinct is right. I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. So, uh, Joan. We're, we're, we're ready for you now. Yeah, Are you um, ready for your close up, Joan Rusk Sorkin? <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, what I was interested in is the marketing after this production that you had in, in October. And um, did you get um, other other companies that want to do this either live later when you know COVID is over or do they want to stream this particular thing? And what did you do in terms of marketing as soon as it was done? And actually, that goes to a very good question that I didn't ask, which is what, were your, what was your purpose in doing this? What was your goal? We had a lot of goals. We wanted to raise money for some great organizations. We wanted to get our show out there. We wanted people to see our piece that we believe in. And, it was, and doing it this way was a way to get all of that accomplished. Um, we do have, uh, we're, we're in contact with some of the licensing houses. We're trying to figure out the best way to go. We want to get... We feel like the show is perfect to be done at schools and church groups, and so so in uh, in doing this this video thing, we were able to get it you know in front of a lot of eyeballs, and there's been interest, and we still will, are going to want to work with uh, the Encore Theater in Michigan, um, and we don't. It's funny because I've never felt like it's a Broadway show, but so many people who said to me, "Don't say that. Think of all the stuff that's been on Broadway that." you might not think would be a Broadway show and it very well could be. And, and since, since we did it at this level, I can sort of see that I could imagine that. So I'm not counting it out. I apologize for my That's okay. delivery. <laughs> oh, well, that hasn't happened before. Actually it happened once. once okay. before. All right. So I didn't hear the whole answer, so I can't ask an intelligent question. <laughs> no, no good follow-up. I can't even remember what I said. Oh yeah, just that, that we were we were hoping that the show will be done in the future and, and it's it's kind of out there and people know about it now, which is great. So you talked about the fact that the bulk of the marketing, it sounds like was done by Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. Um, so you don't really know what they did or do you? Yeah, I mean, there was, a, there was an aggressive, well, because, October, uh, Broadway Cares has a, a newsletter that goes out at the beginning of every month. So we were featured heavily in that. Um, they, they do all kinds of email blasts. Broadway World has an enormous email um, list and Broadway World did lots of articles about our kids. These, the two sisters that you mentioned that we found. Um, Bra Richie Ridge had us on Broadway uh, Beat. We talked uh, with him. Uh, all, a lot of the guys in the show were on uh, one day and that was super fun. So we, we did we did as much, you know, getting the word out there as we could. And it was seen by thousands of people. Do you, do you, have, do you happen to know how many views it was? I don't. I don't yeah. because it was because it was on these different platforms. It's impossible to know. I think it was like 10,000 on YouTube. But then there were there was the Broadway world. And I don't know. OK, well, I hope that I got a lot of people from TRU to, to tune in because I was I promoted it in my Thank newsletter. You. Thank you. Um, so what else can I ask you? How you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm so busy. I, 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 I'm busier than I was last year, which is bizarre. <laughs> but I'm working with Roberto on a new project. He's asked me to uh, music direct and arrange a, a project that he's uh, producing, um, which I'm really excited about, which will have a lot of Broadway folks, Julia Murney and Jay Armstrong Johnson and some wonderful folks. That's going to... Jay Armstrong Johnson. I love Jay Armstrong Johnson. He's great. He's great. That's going to air January 30th. So the bulk of our work is in January, but I'm creating the... I'm doing takedowns of the opera. It's a, it's a Mexican opera called Anjou, and it's never been... Uh, it's never existed in music form, which, of course, we need to do the project. So I'm working on that right now. So before COVID hit, 
were there projects that, that you were going to be involved in that got canceled? Oh, absolutely. So tell us about how that was for you. I mean, uh, we've all of us are going through emotional stuff. So, so let, let us, you know, be, you can be honest with us. Oh, of course. Um, it's been, uh, at first, almost unbelievably devastating, but I, I, I always go back to, I feel like we, you know, because we're artists, we're like clever, creative people. We can always find a way. And I mentioned to the people I mean, in this room. Yeah, exactly. We're all finding ways of, of getting our art happening, our music happening. I've written more songs since the lockdown than I've written in my life. And, and I've them, hosted more panels during the lockdown than I've yeah. hosted in my entire life. I mean, it's it's remarkable what, what we can do. But at first it was just, I mean, I was supposed to conduct a concert version of South Pacific in New York last summer. I was supposed to do the original cast of And the World Goes Round, you know, that Kander and Deb musical. They were getting together for a 30th anniversary concert uh, in Jersey I was supposed to uh, put together. Um, That's yeah. a great cast. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that originally. Yeah, it's like great. four four incredible people who I who I whose names I should know, like oh, Karen, Karen Mason or Karen, Karen Mason. Was it? Yeah, Bob Cuccioli and Bob Cuccioli. Yes, of course. Yeah. So, um, so you know, but you just sort of uh, go, okay, that's not happening. Um, now, what is happening? And um, fortunately, there's there's a lot happening. Yeah, there's more happening when we when we adapt and adjust. Uh, a lot of people are very resentful of pen, of the pandemic. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really blame them, but uh, being resentful and and being it shouldn't push put you into a place of, of inactivity. Absolutely. Uh, find find ways to keep in the keep in in the game to keep doing it. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of creativity that can happen. It's not live theater. I keep saying this. We know it's not live theater, um, but it's what we have. So uh, and we'll be back, you know, it's not going to be right away. It's not going to be, you know, May, like they're saying it's I have a friend at Disney who says that they're talking realistically about fall 2020 as being the time when we can really, really possibly begin to think about gathering in a small theater and uh, feeling comfortable. Yeah, I think by then a, a vaccine will have happened and will have been did I say 2022. Uh, I meant I hope I did. You said 2021. 2022. You think 2022? Oh, good. Well, that's what they're that's what they're saying at Disney. Okay. Um, Mary Miko wants to remind us that Shakespeare wrote King Lear during the other pandemic. Yes, he did. Yes, so he did. yeah. Um, and Larry Daggett um, wants to know how did the editor fix the early vocal entrances? Did Roberta just meet the singers during those beats? How did they fix the multiple cutoffs? Basically, Larry, if you've ever been in a recording studio. It's the same. It's basically the same process. You, you're, you're, everybody's on a separate track, and you can literally stretch, move uh, any vocal line anywhere you need to, to do it. I, you know, I've, I've done entire CDs that way. It's it's actually it's actually fun. Yeah, it's a lot of work though. When you have we in our finale, choose to be kind. There were 130. There were 140 people singing in that. So if you can imagine how that is stacked and how how much that is to to uh, coordinate and fix and clip and trim and now I want you to know that I watched I watched Dicks and Stones closely enough that when you had the 135 people ensemble chorus I actually noticed a couple of people who were muted because they obviously were not were not in the right yeah and Roberto <laughs> was able to move around a lot of people so you wouldn't see it but sometimes that we had some kids with disabilities and we had some you know there were there were some challenges but um, we're proud of that that's okay. So, um, any other questions from the room? Well, John, it, it's actually great. I, I kind of feel like we're 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 friends once we're moved because we have friends in common. Yes, and do. I think in all these years, have we? I don't think we actually ever met face to face. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't think we have. So it's know. it's it's great to finally meet you. Right um, and I want to thank you for uh, being part of this discussion today and leading and sharing so much with us. Uh, what I was trying to say before is basically you have other people in the room who want to do what you've done. So if I've broken it down as, as much as I could, uh, fine. If, if there are still questions from the room about things that I haven't had him cover yet, like Jenny Lynn, you have your hand, your hand raised now.
Oh, yeah, I just had a quick question about, uh, you mentioned th this idea of the people who were actually in different rooms visually looking similar and how your uh, film editor did that. But I'm wondering about the audio. Was there any, did you have any issues with making it sound like people were in the same space? Yes, and, and we, we sent out recording guidelines that we put our heads together and um, asked people to, you know, deaden the room, put blankets, pillows around so you don't have a lot of slap back. So it's, it's a, um, that's very, very helpful. Um, we asked people to use their outboard microphones if they have them. Um, we, uh, and, and we got a lot of, we got lucky in a lot of cases. There were a few early videos from Josh who played David where the room was not dead enough and it was, and Ron wasn't able to control some of the natural reverb that was coming out of it. We weren't even sure if he was sending us a, a pre-mixed reverb, but it was actually the room. So then we did some adjustments and, um, and fixed the rest of it. And you'd never know because Ron was able to do his wizardry um, to make it sound pretty great. So the sound editing and, the editing and the video editing are done separately, I guess. Yes. And then you have to put the two together. Right. So like, video, uh, so audio is done first in our in our case, and then the audio stuff is sent to video, even a rough audio, and then he can hear it, and he, then he starts uploading the videos, and then he can see what he's got to work with, and how is he going to, you know, put them together and tell the story. He's following the script. He sees what what the goal is and then and then he works his magic. And just to, also to state something um, that's that may be obvious to some, because none of this is actually being, it's all being recorded individually in everybody's home, there's really no sync problems. You, the, the sound and, the, and, the, uh, and the, the picture should not have any real, real problems in terms of synchronization. The, Although sometimes, you know, if, if, a, if one of the, let's say one of the brothers, if he sang his, his line at the wrong time, if he came in too early, because he's sitting at home, he's like waiting, rest, 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 wait, eight bars. Now I sing, la da 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 da. Now I wait, wait, wait. I'm hearing the piano, but I'm waiting. I don't hear anybody else singing. So I don't know really when to come in. I've practiced, I think I know, and I'm sometimes guessing, and sometimes I sing the line two bars early, for example. So that, that, that line has to be moved two bars later, uh, both visually and audio wise. So sometimes Roberto will make that adjustment. He'll come back or he'll freeze it or he'll, he can massage it in a million different ways. Well, that's pretty complicated. <laughs> it's, it requires a lot of skill. So congratulations yeah, you, on, on what you did. It was, thank you. It was you very impressive. The edits that I got that were missing lines or they were in the wrong place. Ron has a score, but he doesn't know it as well as I do. And I was able to say, you know, Abraham is singing eight bars early. I have to move him back here. And so there was so much back and forth. It's, it, it was a monumental I, I will never do such a big <laughs> virtual thing again. <laughs> That's just too many people. It's too many people to organize, to corral. We did one Zoom on the finale where we had, and Zoom can only take 100 people. That's just, that's just Zoom. And we had more than 100 who needed to go, come in to that rehearsal. And some people, if they came late, they couldn't get in. So we recorded it and we made it available for everybody to watch. But it's just too many people. Don't do it. Don't do it with too many people. <laughs> There's a lot of logistics involved. In My this. biggest advice to you, keep it small. Yeah, I'm, 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 not, I'm not aiming for 135. No. I'm, I'm aiming for maybe 20 or 25. That's manageable. Yeah. Um, I see Mila and Sam have their hands raised. So Mila, you go first. Hi, John. It, it's uh, Mila Ivieva here. Yeah. I'm a big supporter of uh, going to the uh, Actors Fund retirement homes where many wonderful Broadway uh, and screen performers uh, end up spending their last days. Yeah. So I'm wondering if this is something that your project might uh, be taken there to give them some entertainment uh, either on the screen or uh, live if you all want to uh, dive back in. I think the, the, thing, the thing that was recorded can't be shown anymore. Ah, 
Yeah, so, that, our, our video presentation is, is done. I mean, but we, I'm sure, but I'm sure John has no problem with coord, coordinating, coordinating 150 people to do another performance of it. He's, he's, ready, he's ready to do that tomorrow. We're talking, it's, we're laughing about it, but one of my dreams is like in five years to gather everyone who was in it at Lincoln Center and do like a one night thing. It would be so cool. It's, a, it's a dream. I'll keep my fingers crossed. Okay. Thank Thanks you. so much. Now. Thanks, Mila. And Sam Berland, I don't see your hand raised now, but I think you. Still yeah, I'm here. Um, I have a question. Uh, when you're when someone is singing along with someone, can't you have their or the person singing with the music, and then the person that's supposed to go with them singing? Can't they hear them on on a track so they can actually accompany? You know, to know where the their their point supposed to come in when they're supposed to sing. We did that a little bit. We did that with some of the close duets. So one one would record first, and when we would send the second one, the vocal would be on the track. We did that where we knew it was important that they really be in sync. But there was no way to do that with, let's say, the eight bro seven brothers, because there wasn't. There wasn't, there, but with there was, duet, there was there was basically no no main line that could everybody else could sing to because the brothers all had different lines right and harmonies there. and you know just so that's why we would and we still do it that way too. I'm working with Playville on something else we're doing a we're leading up to World AIDS Day December first and doing some performances and I just I've been making some piano tracks for some folks um, and that's that's kind of the standard now you know we just send the piano and they sing along with it and then the editors put it together. Even you have your head raised. Hi, John. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, how many did you actually have to ask to re-record apart from um, your David? I mean, I'm thinking for the secondary characters. Nobody, nobody. We worked with what we got. We, we decided because we could have, we could have, but we would have been chasing our tail and we didn't have time. So we had to work with what we got. Well, that makes me bow in the dust even more because it was amazingly done. There was so just a few times during that yeah. performance where, you know, voices were out of sync. Yep. So that was, whoa. We fixed Kudos. everything. If we had had a little more time, we would have fixed even more, but we just had the time we had. Yeah, and I agree with you that audio is actually vastly more important than video I mean, or visual. It's amazing yeah, that it is. The impression that, that a, just a, a, somebody with baby eyes and ears watching, um, we were more forgiving of video, uh, but when the, when the music is in the sound, the audio is not in sync, it's, it's jarring. Yeah, okay. I'm you. not sure whether I heard the, the answer to a, an earlier question. Basically, I, I got the schedule. Uh, the September 28th was the, the day that everything was supposed to be given to your tech guy. How long did it take him to create what he created? Um, well, he started a little bit before September 28th with a few things that came in early, some of the solos. Um, but he started getting the, the big dumps of giant numbers. I mean, even in some of the other songs had 30 people. You know, I mean, it was a lot, it was, it was a lot. Um, so he, I would say end of September and we had to deliver it on the 15th. Um, and he was flying in final mixes right up until the end. So a tight schedule, but a realistic one is about six weeks <clears throat> from the start, from, from sending, sending this tracks to the, uh, to the singers. Cause he, yeah. he said he started at the beginning of September. Yeah, we well, we, we would start with a Zoom rehearsal just to make sure that the, we didn't want to change the key. And in some cases we did change the key. In some cases I said, you know what? We don't need these four bars. These four bars are going. So you'll just have, you know, six beats and then you're back in, stuff like that. So I was tailoring it as we were rehearsing, making sure that they were comfortable with the intro. <clears throat> and some songs were in different we had to do in three parts if a song changes tempo, you know, we, it was, and we had to then put it all together. It was super complicated. Okay, so uh, I have to do something like this in January. So this was very helpful. Good. Um, reach out if you need other, if you have other questions that come up.
I, I probably will. And uh, I want to thank you so much for it. I'm thanking you again. Because if I guess every time I thank you, another hand goes up. So, That's but right. uh, thank you. And um, I want to thank everybody for being with us today. I want to thank the community. Uh, as you know, I'm, I'm foolishly grateful to everybody for actually making this something that, that is of value um, and caring and being with us and being engaged. Um, I appreciate that very much. And I will be here every week with different interviews with different people so that you can be part of this community. Um, next week, uh, we're going to talk about, we have a, a theater architect coming. And we also have the uh, facilities manager from the public theater. We're going to talk about what has to be done to theaters to actually make live theater possible again. So it's an interesting conversation. Um, unlike today, where a lot of us are planning on doing virtual presentations uh, that we hope will be as good as sticks and stones. None of us are planning on building or rebuilding theaters, but nevertheless, I think it's a conversation uh, that's worth having. So I hope you'll join us. And remember that we do this for free. Um, you know, it's, it's the usual thing. We do this for free, uh, but if you want to support us, I won't stop you. Uh, and you can always go to our, our website, trueonline.org. Uh, you can go to the donation page, which which is true online, tru online dot org slash make hyphen a hyphen donation, uh, all lowercase. Um, there's another URL, uh, Joe, uh, Joe Nelms, if you're in the room, uh, put the other URL in that you, that you got for us for the donations. Um, and and um, that's it, folks. Uh, that's our Zoom for today. And I want everybody to say thank can... you to everybody. It was so nice to see some great friends and wonderful to meet new ones. And find me on Instagram, John McD123. Okay. And if, if you want to stay, we're going to do breakout rooms so people can meet each other. 